And we're watching 40 meters fall apart. How's everybody doing? Steve K1GMM. The maniac, the hack in the shack. The itch in the ditch. How's everybody doing? Hey, Peter, Michael, Tim, how you guys doing? We're going to do a, uh, per request, a little thing on Grayline. And this is mostly for the newcomers. Maybe relevant to uh, people that are more seasoned veterans, don't know. Hard saying, not knowing, but had a request from Quentin, Quentin, in Nova Scotia. He said, Can you do something on Gray Line? And I said, Sure. So we are going to do just that. So I've got a couple things I'm going to show you, and I'm going to try and make a feeble attempt at explaining exactly what gray line is. And we're not going to do a music trivia thing tonight, this afternoon, but we are going to do a, a TV series trivia. And this is very relevant for what's coming. So I'm going to sing something, not really sing it, but you guys, you guys uh, hit the chat. It's not going to go into the chat, but you're going to have to listen to it. So. The person who guesses it first wears the crown for the for the stream. And it's going to be a really easy one. And you'll understand why I do this. So here we go. When you hear this, gear gear up and put it in the stream. Just name the, the TV series. Uh, the name of the TV series. Here we go. Ready? Okay. What is that? What's that from? What series is that from? Come on, folks. There you go. Michael, you got it. <laughs> Glenn, Peter, too slow. Too slow. Well, Michael, you must have been, you must have been like, you, you are like the trigger man. Uh, I want you protecting me from now on. Mike's the trigger man. Um, so there you go. All right. So without further ado, do TP for my do do. I need. Um, I'm going to show you a couple things, uh, but first thing I'm going to show you actually, which is which is relevant. I've been watching this over the past hour, so let's get over the pan adapter. We'll get this turned on. And we are on 40 meters. And I'm actually pointed southwest currently. So I've been watching signals come up, coming from Europe. Now we are technically, let me pop this bag boy on. Oh gosh. We are a long ways off of gray line. So let me show you this quick. And this has to do with the mystery. Okay, the mystery. So let me get the other screen on. Okay. So what you're looking at is Simon's world map. All right, so let me just, uh, let me shut this, mute this for a second. So this is Simon's world map. Now my QTH is right here, northeastern United States. This is the gray line, or what is commonly known as the Terminator. All right, this, when you hear people say Terminator, that's what this is. Now this is the twilight zone. This zone right here, from right here to right here is the twilight zone. Now you understand why I uh, did the twilight zone bit. So, uh, this, is the, this is the peak. This is when gray line 
This is the approaching levels of gray line, and these are the receding levels. So as this moves east to west, this is coming this way, all right, we're going to go from light to dark, all right? So this is pretty much full daylight right here. This is darkness, all right? Now this is relevant. Uh, 40 meters right now, yes, it is susceptible to gray line, but... <clears throat> the reason why I wanted to show you this is I wanted to show you how far off gray line was off the east coast right now. We're a long ways off, okay? Um, now, if we jump back over to the pan adapter to 40 meters, I'll get this cracked open. As long as you can dissipate the heat, whatever the amplifier is. All right, so... So we're listening to 40 meters stateside. So what I want you to do is watch the pan adapter. I'm going to flip it going northeast towards Europe in three, two, one. Okay, there's probably a couple things you noticed. This is AM broadcast coming out of Europe right here. Right in this area. Uh, let me go back to, uh, to the southwest. Went to the southwest just now. Okay, so we got AM broadcast pouring in. I'm going to click through about a half hour ago. I was listening to stations. They're weak, and they should be weak right now, but they're starting to come in on 40. So if you're on the eastern seaboard, uh, current time 2137 UTC, it's coming up to 2138. And if you go back to this map, we are a long ways off a of gray line, and there are already signals coming in. Okay. Uh, into the northeast over here. So if I click on this, okay, so that's an Echo Alpha station. Echo Alpha 1, Yankee Oscar. Easily workable. Echo Alpha 1, Yankee Oscar. Echo Alpha 1, Yankee Oscar. Okay, so we have already these are all stationed. Now, how do I know they're coming out of Europe? Aside from the fact that that one is obviously speaking Spanish, well, if I flip the antenna going back southwest, wait for him to come back. Hey, okay, we're going southwest now. Uh, this has got a roughly 15 dB front to back, which is exactly what it should have. Um, okay, going back. So the the stateside station just disappeared. And the European station just came up. So, why is that important? I wanted to, you to see the time, the timing, okay, of those signals coming in from Europe and how far off gray line is here. Uh, this is the mystery that I will be honest with you, I do not understand because what we're going to get into is relevant to the lower frequencies. We're talking uh, 30 meters and down. 30, 40, 80. 160 is kind of a weird one. Uh, that doesn't function uh, it, it, similar. It's kind of similar uh, in the sense that uh, D layer is a brick wall. But um, the way propagation works on 160, there's actually not a lot understood about it. Uh, there's a, a, and I'm not going to go deep into that because we're really talking about gray line, but the only thing I'll say about 160 based upon what I read and what I've learned is that uh, there's something called, I can't remember if, I think they call it ducting or tunneling. I think it's ducting. Um, 160 is a very strange band uh, for DXing. It's an oddball. So I'm going to actually stop this. And stand by. All 
Okay. So, why are signals coming in out of Europe on this band when you won't hear anything on 80 meters with gray line this far off? Now, gray line is mostly relevant on like 80 meters, right? 80 meters gray line is, is very important. Um, and I'm going to get into exactly what the gray line is. Um, 40 meters, I believe, I believe what is happening is because as you go up in wavelength, uh, in higher in frequency and shorter in wavelength, it penetrates the D layer absorption. The D, it penetrates the D layer much easier. That's why D layer pretty much doesn't have an effect on 14 megahertz and up. Um, I can tell you that 30, 30 meters, 10 megahertz, yes, D line does, uh, uh, gray line has an effect on 30 meters. All right. I've seen it. We've seen it. Um, when I was uh, testing the mag loop, all of a sudden, boom, uh, I'll show up in out north of Mongolia, down in VK. Uh, so, and I won't see that. Now, the path it's taking, I'm not exactly sure. It could be, it could be riding the gray line. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into that whole, all that stuff, but all right, so let's get going. I'm going to tell you exactly what, so let me minimize this. You're going to have to bear with me because there's going to be a couple things I have to pop up. So I need to make sense of this. So Basically, gray line, uh, I made some notes here. Um, gray line or gray line propagation. Uh, it's basically a form of prop propagation that people use to make the jump to light speed. In other words, it has, it provides characteristics in the propagation that allow you to work extremely long distances like global distances when other forms of propagation don't. Um, hence, that's the reason why your hardcore DXers, even if, let me give you a scenario, even if, tw let's say 20 meters, right? 20 meters, let's say it's an open band. Well, more often than not, you won't be able to work 10, 11,000 mile hops on the shorter wavelengths. You'll get conditions that will provide that, yes. But what gray line does is it allows you to work long path, huge distances, uh, because of the characteristics of the changes taking place at that time in the different parts of the atmosphere. Um, so when does gray line happen? It happens twice a day. Uh, it happens at dusk and it happens at dawn. Now, it is also a seasonal thing because if you go back and you look, okay, let me get back. Jeez, I'm on the wrong display. So if you go back and look at this, and I'm referring to the seasonal aspect of it, if you look at this, and you gray line is not like a straight line that runs across the globe. Um, from one place to another. Now you'll notice there's two gray lines. There's a gray line currently in central VK, Australia, and gray line has actually moved. Uh, I'm not sure. I believe uh, Pacific Asia is up in here, right? Um, they are deep into uh, sunlight now. So gray lines moved past them long time ago. VK is still in, uh, in sunlight. Now, because the earth tilts on its axis, and we go into summer in the northern hemisphere, our days become very long. Now, the best time to work gray line propagation is, I'll give you an example. So let's say you're in January, right? Well, January, you'll see this gray line at approximately 4 p.m. in the afternoon, it'll be coming onto the eastern seaboard. And if you look over here in VK, a uh, gray line is just approaching this side of VK, and that's uh, 
roughly 10 to 11,000 miles. That's on the other side of the planet. So we're coming into darkness. They're coming into daylight. So hence the reason why you want to ride this gray line. If you want to work long distance propagate, uh, look for long distance contacts, you have to do it on the wavelengths that gray line has the most effect on. And you're going to ask me, you're going to say, well, why, what the heck difference does it make? Why does gray line have an effect on anything? Uh, F layer, you know, F2, you got the F1, F2 layer, uh, that's still there, right? Well, your shorter wavelengths, like 20 meters and up, rely, well, all propagation relies on the F layer. Uh, take E layer, sporadic E out of the equation. Um, the F layers are critical for long haul propagation, actually any type of pro radio propagation, right? So, and... Remember, the F1 and F2 layers combine after dark. Once it goes completely dark, they combine and become one. Um, also, the, the amount of energy involved in that the F2 layer uh, generally quiets down at night. Um, hence, and what I'm about to show you, this will explain why this propagation happens. Uh, so I wanted to show you that gray line effect. So, you know, the summertime is really not the best time. If you look at this and then you look at this, I mean, they're already, <laughs> they're already in full sun in this part of EK, full sun. We're in full sun. So that ain't going to work. You know, on 80 meters, uh, we've got, we're going to have a very tight window. As this gray line moves this way, this one's moving this way. There's going to be a very short window where we can chase the gray line and get long haul propagation, long path into this area. Okay, hope you, hopefully I explain that so so anybody who really doesn't know anything about this can understand it. Hence, the winter time into fall through spring is the time you want to spend all your time in here because you get a much larger window. As gray lines approaching East Coast United States, it's just starting to approach here. See what I'm saying? By the time Gray Line gets into the East Coast here, it's going to be well off. It's going to be off the coast of Australia. They're going to be in full sunlight. Now, why is that important? Here we go. Uh, just to let you know, this software is Simon's World Map. Phenomenal piece of software. My favorite world map I've ever seen. Um, killer. Simon's World Map. Type it in. Go get it. Uh, if you like this stuff, I have it running all the time when I get up in the morning and like right now through uh, dark uh, shows me exactly where gray line is and what's going on on the other side of the world. Um, so, all right. And keep in mind, I am no expert on this. I'm going to just preemptively strike. All right. I'm probably going to say things that may not be necessarily 100% accurate. If you want like an expert's take on this, uh, get online and go look at uh, NASA stuff and all this other stuff. This is layman's, layman's terms. All right. This is so people who know nothing about this can understand this. And I know just enough to be really dangerous. So, all right. That being said, let me get back to, I'm going to close this map because I think we're done with that. Um... So, so basically gray line is the area where night and day meet or day and night meet, depending on which part of the world you're in as gray lines coming across. Um, there, it's most notable, noticeable on the lower frequencies. And you're going to ask me, why the heck is it most notable, noticeable on the lower frequencies? Well, this is why. So let me get this up. Okay, and this is important. Okay, so I made this up for you, so it'll give you, it's not to scale, don't chastise me. <laughs> this just gives you a rough idea. So we got the Earth's surface here, right? You got the D layer, which is, which is highly absorptive uh, during the day. Uh, during sunlight, and there's a video on my YouTube channel somewhere regarding D layer. 
So you can go back in and watch this. Watch that. Not going to go into it. Uh, D-layer during the day is basically a brick wall on lower frequencies, longer wavelengths. That's why on 80 meters, um, even 40 meters, uh, 40 meters, yes, uh, it has a dramatic effect, um, but it's 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 much more subtle on 40 generally. Uh, usually got to get down in the 4 megahertz realm and down for D layer to become a huge factor. So the reason why, like on 80 meters, you have long, you'll see the band stretch out at night is because the sun goes down and D layer basically opens up so that these particular wavelengths can get through to the F layer and start to propagate long distances. All right. So that's basically in a nutshell. That's 30 to 70 miles uh, roughly in there somewhere off the surf, off Earth's surface. Right. Then you have the E layer, which is 70 to 100 miles up. And then the F1 layer, 100 to 150 up. F2 layer is 150 to 200 miles. Why is this important? I'm about to show you. Uh, let me get back over here. All right, I made this up for you guys. It is very rudimentary, but I think it will explain everything you need to know about why gray line works so well and how it works, mostly how it works and why it works. So we've got sunlight, right? The sun. This part of the earth right here is facing the sun. All right, that's in full sunlight. You've got uh, the green area is the F1, F2 layer. Okay, that's responsible for long haul propagation. The gray area is the D layer. Now remember where they were stacked above the surface of the earth, right? Well, of course, as you get closer to the surface of the earth, and there's a lot more involved in this that I'm not going to go into. You can you can go online and read about it. Um, has to do with ions, uh, uh, um, the electromagnetic radiation uh, that takes place from your antennas, and, and there's there's two different fields, uh, two different components, of course, to an antenna. Uh, there's an electrical com electro com electrical component. There's a magnetic component. Um, I'm not going to go into that. You can read about that. Uh, it, it, my eyes glaze over. <laughs> but uh, it'll help you understand because it is relevant to these layers and ions and protons and uh, molecules and all that other stuff. That, that information you can get online, all right, uh, anywhere. So here you've got, let's say, Billy Bob's HF station, right? Now... What happens is if you see where his station is, right? And you look at these two layers, what's happening? Now I'm talking about this is a gray, this is the gray line transition. Uh, let's say the earth is rotating. The earth is rotating and Billy Bob station is right here. And you've got the sun, which is theoretically up. The sun is still shining on the F layer at this point. However, the sun is no longer shining on the D layer at this point. This is out of full sun because it's closer to the earth. What happens is, is this D layer, as a sunlight is trying to hit this D layer and it's coming in, it's only reaching about this far and this is going into darkness. So what, what happens to D layer? Remember, this starts to fade. The D layer starts to fade now your signals start to penetrate the D layer and head off into the F layer. And there you go, Johnson. F layer is still fully charged. D layer is disappearing. And that is how you achieve the propagation from here, boom, here, boom, here, boom, here. On the earth. Uh, to here, actually. Well, theoretically. <laughs> right uh so do you get it now that is what is actually happening at gray line gray line is the period where d layer is moving into the shadow and it's starting to disappear 
and your signals now can penetrate that layer and hit the F2 layer, which is now fully charged. So you're thinking, okay, well, how does that work at sunrise? Well, the reverse happens. So you have no absorption at sun, sunrise in the D layer. And we've all worked stations on 80 meters. A lot of people get up early in the morning because they do round tables and they speak with people that are like 2,000 miles away on 80. Uh, let's just take that for an example. Well, they can do it. Because, but remember, at night, F1 and F2 layers tend not to be as active, as uh, reflective. Okay, that's a key thing when you're thinking about this. Um, at night, see, once this, this station, this, or the Earth continues to turn out of the uh, Earth-facing disk of the sun, and the F layer is no longer. So once you get down in here, F layer is no longer receiving sunlight. Um, it, it's less charged. Okay, this is what makes gray line so killer is because you've got a fully charged F2 layer and no D layer. And that only happens two times a day. Hopefully you guys, uh, that gives you a picture. So in the morning, you've got a weak F2 layer, F, uh, F2 layer, F1, F2, because they're combined. Now what happens? The earth is rotating and all of a sudden, the F2 layer comes into full sun, boom, that lights up, everything starts dancing around, starts becoming reflective. Meanwhile, D layer has not established yet because it's still in darkness. So you have a gray line propagation situation during uh, sunrise. Uh, so that's basically, in a nutshell, how that works. Um, Hopefully you guys uh, get that. Uh, I told you this was going to be layman's terms, and it was uh, it's down and dirty, but but that's basically it. Uh, let me get uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, shoot through the chat. Yes, it is free, Michael. Free map. I don't think there's any comments or questions, and I'm just going to rip the plug out of the wall. Um, okay. um, Chris, uh, there's a couple things. Yeah, that that kind of makes me think of a couple situations here. Um, anybody who's been in the hobby, which I have not, but I've been radio for a while, but in the actual hobby, no, since 2015. So anybody who's been in the hobby for a while um, will know that there are some very odd anomalies that happen. Um, at the peak of a cycle, you'll often see like 20 meters open all night long. I've had countless people say say that to me they're like oh yeah you know cycle 23 24 sucked but like 22 23 those were freaking gangbusters man every all the people i know that that have been in the hobby for like 30 40 years they're like yeah 24 was was pathetic compared to 22 and 23 i mean 20 was open all night freaking long um <laughs> how do you explain that um i don't know uh, the only thing I can speculate is that uh, sunspots are so strong that the F2 layer is so charged that it doesn't even really settle down after dark. Um, there's a lot of anomalies that happen that are above my pay grade. I don't know how to explain it. Uh, 10 meters, it's such a high wavelength that... Um, I mean, 10. I've heard uh, people say 10 meters was open till like 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, back in the glory day, days, you know. Um, so, does that happen consistently on a weak solar cycle? I don't know. Maybe somebody could chime in on uh, at the peak of cycle 24, the one we just came through. 
uh, it was horrid. Now keep in mind the SFI, when the when I got into the hobby, the SFI was 140. That is technically poor to moderate conditions. And I was working all over the place, man. So that's all I know. That's all I know is an SFI of 140 and then it plummeted from there. So uh, this was 2015. And then it was a steady decline from 2015. And now we're back down to 71, I heard yesterday. I don't know what it is today. Uh, made a little pop, ooh, to 80, and now it took a dump again. So we're still at the bottom, folks. Um, when you see that F up, SFI climb above 100 and stay above 100, we're making tracks. That is all I know. Now, you're talking SFI back in the glory days. What, what was it, cycle 22, 23? Holy crap. I mean, an SFI of 180 is good. We never got, I mean... <laughs> or more. Uh, that's cracking. That's gangbusters. We had a long haul to pull out of this. Keep in mind, be patient, everybody. Glenn and I talk about this all the time. Uh, it's going to take a while. It's 11 years. I'll probably be dead before I see. I don't think I'll see another solar cycle, to be honest with you. I think I may just barely get through this one. But uh, uh, that's it, man. Mike, how you doing? So, uh, like I said, these are not to scale. They're just a demonstration, what I showed you, of uh, kind of how all that works. And I'm referring only to gray line. So that's it. No other comments. I'm gone. Seven three, you guys. I did it for uh, Quentin. And I hope you find it useful. If you don't, I tried. I'm sure it could be done better. We'll see you all later. Seven three. K1GMM.